Hello. Today we are going to be talking about chaos in flows and particularly about the Lorenz and the Rossler systems which are very archetypical chaotic systems. In the last week, weeks rather, we have been uh, worrying about how to describe dynamics in nonlinear systems. We have worried a lot about how to characterize it using a variety of different measures, Lyapunov exponents, fractal dimensions and so on. And by and large, we have used very simple mathematical models to illustrate the concepts that have been introduced. These concepts, it turns out, apply quite widely because in nature there is an abundance of irregular motion. Common examples of irregular motion include turbulent flows such as rivers uh, or you know the roads of Delhi during a, the rain and whenever you have a lot of water that has to move from one place to another, the flow can be extremely complicated. The image that you see over here on, on the right of the screen uh, is from an illustration by Leonardo da Vinci uh, and it dates back to a few hundred years ago and he was one of the first people to describe what turbulent motion looks like. And you can see over here that as he has observed very keenly, turbulent motion seems to have a lot of water or fluid that is moving around in some kind of a circular fashion. The image that you see on your screen to the right is uh, from an illustration by Leonardo da Vinci. It dates back to the 1600s. And Da Vinci describes what turbulent, the structure of turbulent motion. Uh, if you have a fluid where, the, uh, where the, the liquid in this particular case is moving around in a sort of a crazy fashion, you have these very interesting, uh, you have this interesting motion where there are whorls, whorls of you know, movement of, of these large, large scale motion of the fluid in a, in a circular fashion over here. And this then feeds into a smaller whorl and these have got sort of an interesting vorticity structure over here, these smaller whorls and so on. And then you have these tiny little whorls all over the place. Okay? Now, this image of turbulence is still a major challenge to most uh, to theoretical physicists. In fact, it is supposed to be one of the large unsolved problems in physics. Now, even simpler, if you light a candle and switch it off, you find that this candle, if you know, if you have got the conditions exactly correct, the smoke from the candle flows upwards and then at a certain point there is an instability and it starts becoming turbulent. This is an example of what is termed a transition to turbulence and many systems have this, namely uh, you have a regime where the motion is smooth, this entire regime the motion is very smooth. And then there is an instability of some kind and then it becomes turbulent. So, th this, this is a thermal convection plume riding, uh, rising from an ordinary candle in air. Examples like this uh, are, are very, very common as are a whole lot of other examples in fluid flow. Every morning when you make a cup of tea or uh, actually when you make a cup of soup, we witness uh, the rayleigh bena instability and this is an instability that happens when fluids are heated from one side and uh, like typically as shown over here, you have a fluid being heated from below and it is open to the air up here. So, the temperature on top is lower than the temperature uh, over here, uh, the temperature below. So, there is a temperature gradient and because of the temperature gradient, what happens in the fluid is that convective rows are set up. The fluid rises from here 
and now since it has to, uh, since it can't go further up, it goes to the surface of the uh, fluid and then it comes down. So that you set up these uh, convective flows uh, of motion in a fluid. You can actually see this rather nicely when you heat soup. Uh, a soup has got a little higher viscosity, uh, higher density than ordinary water. So when you're making uh, one of these packaged soups, for example, and boiling it, you find that these convective rolls are set up. And the image of these convective rolls on the surface turns out to be these uh, hexagonal patterns that, you, that are visible in this particular cup. These are so common uh, that one finds many, many such images uh, on the internet. And I have taken this particular image from uh, precisely uh, the internet. A more uh, interesting, in many ways, still worthy of a lot of study, uh, a, an instability which uh, is common in fluids and again is found you know, in a lot of uh, everyday types of flows is the so-called Kuwait flow. Now this Kuwait flow occurs when you've got a fluid encased between two concentric rotating cylinders. So the image on the left over here shows this uh, geometry. You've got one cylinder of radius R1, and that is rotating at an angular velocity of omega 1. The outer cylinder has got radius R2, and that is rotating at the angular velocity of omega 2. Fluid is enclosed between these two cylinders. And uh, as you rotate the, as the angular, the, as the difference in the angular velocity is changing, you find phenomena, dynamical phenomena that occurs because of what's known as the Taylor Kuwait, the Taylor instability. So you've got this Kuwait flow geometry, and what happens as the angular vel velocity difference increases? is that, again, convective rolls are, um, are set up. And this time, these rolls occur uh, all as sort of toroidal flows between these two walls. In most ex uh, experiments, it's uh, quite common to keep the inner cylinder rotating while the outer cylinder is fixed. So this is a typical geometry that you study uh, this system in. And uh, when, you, when you do that, you find that uh, these convective rolls are set up like little uh, vortices uh, between the inner and the outer walls. And depending on the distance between the inner and the outer walls, uh, you set up vortices of different patterns. Uh, this whole problem is extremely interesting. And uh, as I said, uh, it's still subject to a lot of study. Now, one example where we find this, uh, the Kuwait flow that gets used in a practical situation is uh, in South India, where, uh, where one, you know, the, in order to make dough for uh, dosa or idli, this is the exact geometry that is used, where you have the stationary outer cylinder and you have an inner grinder which moves around. And when the velocity of this inner grinder increases, you can see the uh, fluid, which is in this particular case a slurry of uh, rice and water and so on. This slurry moves around, and you can see the uh, the Taylor instability with the fluid flowing in a, in in a vortex circle. So uh, these are both practical uh, practical examples the Rayleigh-Benard instability, as well as the taylor kuwait flow, both these occur uh, in sort of not in common enough everyday uh, instances. Here is an example of the Kuwait flow in a laboratory, as it happens in this case uh, at uh, JNU. And uh, let me show you an, uh, an image which comes out of YouTube on this one. 
Okay, so here is an example of the Taylor Kuwait instability, which has been carried out in a laboratory at JNU. Uh, the apparatus consists, as you can see over here, of a plexiglass uh, outer cylinder and a uh, rather dark inner cylinder. The fluid enclosed between these two cylinders is a, a glycol solution, and there is a fluid called calidoscope that has been added over here to make the flow visible. What you will see in this, uh, in this uh, little demonstration, and this can be seen on YouTube, um, search for Siddharth Krishnamurthy's name, um, you'll find that uh, first the flow is featureless for very, very low velocities. And then as the, velo as the inner cylinder, which is being rotated, as the velocity increases, there is an instability and these vortices are set up. And you can see the image of the vortices as bands. So let me just show it to you over here. You can see here the Taylor instability and you can see the bands. Now these bands, uh, are going to increase in velocity and there's going to be further instabilities that happen. As you can see over here, developing uh, different kinds of instabilities. And as you keep increasing the velocity uh, of the uh, inner cylinder, you see that the outer cylinder gets increasingly more complex, eventually becoming quite turbulent towards the very end of this particular uh, video. All right. So now to uh, return to the discussion here, based on a study of the Navier-Stokes equation and trying to think of uh, the atmosphere as a, a convective system, uh, which is heated from below, that is the surface of the earth, and you've got a free surface on top, uh, high up, in the 19, early 1960s, Ed Lorenz derived a set of three coupled equations which come from a very, very simplified model of convection rolls in the atmosphere. The motivation was to try to predict the weather, of course, uh, and uh, this, was, this is sort of part of the lore of chaos theory as to how he came about these equations and how he undertook to numerically simulate them. The important point over here is that this set of equations comes to us from the Navier-Stokes equation through a very controlled approximation. And it has this extremely elegant and very simple form uh, where there are three variables, x, y, and z. Uh, and the, uh, it's a set of ordinary differential equations. So and it's almost linear. There are only two nonlinear terms here, which are, uh, which are there in the second and the third equations. And the solutions of these equations have provided enough material for us to study in the last uh, 60 years, and perhaps even, and there will be much more to discover in these equations. Now, the motivation over here was to think of the atmosphere as a fluid which was heated from below and cooled from above. So it is the Rayleigh-Benard problem in some very abstract sense. And an assumption was made that it circulates in two dimensions, uh, namely the vertical and the horizontal, with periodic uh, rectangular boundary conditions and so on. Now, the interesting thing about these equations is that the solutions look something like so, uh, the orbits uh, are uh, in three-dimensional space in x, y, and z. And if you look at them in, in uh, projection, these seem to just be confined to some uh, lower space. So this almost linear deterministic system shows, as, as I will show you in a moment, extremely erratic dynamics, which depends on the values of the parameters. The solutions oscillate 
in a fashion. Over here, you can see that uh, the orbit is going around these two branches of what looks like a butterfly's wings. And as you rotate this image of this object, this is the famous Lorenz attractor, you can see that there are two different segments of this attractor and the orbit seems to go in an erratic manner from one side to the other. Nevertheless, the orbit always seems to remain in the same general area. Lorenz's great observation was that nearby initial con conditions diverge exponentially rapidly from each other. Uh, and one can see this in a simulation. To show sensitivity to initial conditions, we, let us start the orbit from a point over here. In fact, let us start two orbits from a point very close to one another and follow them as the equations are integrated. As you will see over here, the, the uh, and I hope you can see it, the orbits are moving together for some period of time and at a certain point they move now onto different branches of this particular attractor and once they have moved onto different branches these orbits are going to be as far from each other as as the system will allow. The reason that they don't ever move very far from each other is that there is a global attractor. And this global attractor can be seen over here, where I have started with two very different initial conditions. Nevertheless, as time goes on, the orbit eventually fill up the same region of space. So regardless of where you start in phase space, your solutions eventually land up on this part of the, on, on to this part of the uh, phase space and the orbit moves on this object which is the so-called attractor. Now, given the Lorenz equations which are uh, x dot as so, y dot as so, and this is the parameter r over here, uh, r or rho. Uh, and these are the three Lorentz equations. You can immediately see that x is equal to 0, y is equal to 0, and z is equal to 0 leaves, uh, is, is a fixed point of this system. So the origin is a fixed point. But there are also two other fixed points, and these two fixed points happen for uh, under plus or minus under root beta into r minus 1, uh, the same over here, and r minus 1. And these will only exist above uh, the, the value of r is equal to 1. Now, r is the Reynolds number, which you know in the flow would have been the Reynolds number. It here it turns out to be just a parameter and uh, people have studied this system for a variety of different parameter values, mostly as a function of r, keeping these other parameters fixed. There are so-called canonical values of the parameter where sigma is equal to 10 and beta is equal to 8 by 3 for reasons that, uh, that Lorenz has described in his very uh, very readable and a beautiful, brilliant paper that started this field of chaos. As it happens, the same equations arise in models of lasers, in dynamos, and even a mechanical water wheel and a sand wheel. Similar equations seem uh, to come up, and these are discussed in uh, the book by Strogatz. Now, the Lorentz system has extremely interesting behavior, uh, and that's one of the reasons that has contributed to its uh, sort of importance and vitality in this field. The equations themselves, as I have told you earlier, are almost linear. There are these two nonlinear terms over here, uh, and for otherwise, it would have been a linear system. Uh, it has a beautiful symmetry, which is that x 
uh, y and z, if you change x to minus x, y to minus y, keeping z uh, the same, the system looks identical. So, no matter uh, if you have a particular solution, a solution with negative values of x and y and the, the same value of z would also be a valid solution. So, that is the symmetry in this particular system. I have already pointed out that we have these two, uh, uh, these two types of fixed points. One is the origin and then uh, these two fixed points because the square root has the plus or minus sign. Uh, now, these will exist only for r bigger than 1. So, if I were to draw a bifurcation diagram and this is only a, a sort of a sketch of what the system uh, complexity of the system is like. Uh, between r is equal to 0 and r is equal to 1, there is only a single fixed point. At r is equal to 1, you can easily uh, show that this fixed point becomes unstable, but these two fixed points c plus and c minus, that is this is c plus and this is c minus, these two fixed points become stable. Now, these two fixed points are stable up to a certain point over here, which is, uh, which is where a bifurcation happens. This is a Hopf bifurcation, which we have not discussed in this uh, course so far, uh, but it may be discussed in the forthcoming lectures or perhaps in the next course. And uh, after this Hopf bifurcation, these fixed points also become unstable. Lorenz studied the system for the value of r is equal to 28, which is somewhere over here, say, when neither the fixed point at 0 is stable, nor are these fixed points c plus and c minus, uh, they are also not stable. What he observed, therefore, was, uh, was or rather, what he observed was a system which had uh, interesting behavior that you could observe by uh, solving the set of coupled differential equations and you can integrate them yourself uh, and I would urge all of you to do this uh, using standard software like uh, MATLAB or if you write programs by, uh, you can write those, you know, for these equations which are really so elementary and simple. Uh, write down a code in either uh, using the Euler method or the Runge-Kutta method or what have you. And these orbits can be visualized using very standard tools, uh, you know, like G and U plot, uh, which you have in Linux and so on. Now, as you've already seen some of those examples of orbits uh, and you can verify for yourself, when you plot these trajectories in three dimensions, they settle onto a complicated set. And this is nowadays, it's termed a strange attractor. And uh, one can show at least that you have this kind of complicated uh, behavior because there is, the fixed points are unstable, there are no periodic orbits and so on. And this object is a limiting object, but it is not a curve, it's not even a point, it's not a point for sure, it's not a simple closed curve, and it's not even a surface. As it happens, it is a fractal and it has a dimension a little greater than 2. And uh, therefore, because it is a fractal and motion on it does not repeat, you have, you have an example of an attractor on which the dynamics is chaotic. And that's why it is termed a strange attractor. The Lyapunov exponents for this system, we've already been introduced to the idea of a Lyapunov exponent, but since this system is in three dimensions, there are three of them. So the, the sum of the Lyapunov exponents is a large negative number, and this says how rapidly phase space shrinks. But the largest of the Lyapunov exponents is positive, showing that you have chaos. And you can show that it has to be positive for a sufficiently large value of rho. So the system can be studied, uh, and there is a lot of very rich, rich behavior that you can discover about the Lorentz system. 
And as I have said, I would urge you to do that uh, just to see that these concepts uh, are not, uh, that these concepts can also be explored by you. A similar set of equations, uh, in some sense a little simpler, uh, is the, provided by the Rossler attractor. Uh, this was first written down by Otto Rossler in the uh, mid-1970s. And this is even simpler in the sense that there is only a single uh, nonlinear term. Orbits of this system uh, look like so. Uh, again, they do not repeat themselves. They are in three dimensions. And uh, part of the orbit is very flat, almost in the xy plane. And then it shoots off into the z direction and then comes down again. Uh, this system, as it turns out, also has an attractor, as you can see over here. And this is different, of course, from the Rossler butterfly, uh, the, uh, the, sorry, the Lorenz butterfly. The Lorenz butterfly has two uh, branches because there are two fixed points which are um, unstable at that, uh, at that moment. Over here, there is only a single fixed point which is unstable. Rossler pointed out that the flow is actually not confined to a two-dimensional surface, but to a folded disk of finite width. And we can see an image of this folded disk uh, over here. In the Rossler attractor, every cross-section through the flow is two-dimensional rather than one-dimensional. You see, if it was just, if you were to take a cross-section by cutting the Rossler attractor, if it was a simple surface, then that cross-section should have been just a one-dimensional curve or a one-dimensional object. Rossler noted that this assumes the form of a horseshoe between one transition and the next. And this becomes evident if one follows the course of one rectangular cross-section as it is stretched and then folded before it is mapped back onto itself. Okay. So uh, let me just show you uh, this orbit of this system. Uh, as you see over here, the orbit is, uh, you know, it's, it's first almost two-dimensional over here, then it goes in and comes back, and it is this orbit repeatedly which folds into itself, stretching and folding, which makes this motion chaotic. This stretching and folding, uh, in some uh, somewhere where Rossler mentions his motivation, comes from a taffy machine. I'm going to show that to you in a moment. But Basically, nearby points can move very far from each other if you take phase space and stretch it and fold it and stretch it and fold it repeatedly. Uh, the Taffy machine uh, was described by Rossler uh, as the inspiration for some of this, uh, of, of this development. So let me just demonstrate that to you in a, uh, in a moment. Uh, okay. So this is taken out of YouTube, uh, and you can see the reference up there. Uh, let me just play it. And you can see the way in which uh, this taffy uh, it, where different layers of this system. OK, so this is a finite system, and you have the this is an image of the phase space as it is getting stretched and folded and stretched and folded and stretched and folded. Unlike our Rossler system, phase space volumes are not actually decreasing over here because the phase space volume is conserved clearly because we are talking about taffy. Uh, but on the other hand, the stretching and folding that happens in this system is precisely what, uh, what the uh, manipulations of phase space uh, are, what, what is being done to the phase space or how phase space is manipulated in a chaotic dynamical system. 
A common example of this stretching and folding happens when you are kneading dough uh, to either make bread or to make chapatis. Uh, so th again, this is a very practical way in which one sees uh, this kind of dynamics in everyday life. Now, the horseshoe idea that Rossler uh, pointed out was basically to say that what happens the, to the phase flow is that you take this phase, sorry, uh, you take the phase flow, let's take, you, you take a volume in phase space, stretch it out, so you, you know this is the taffy as it was pulled out, then it's folded back onto itself and then squished up again. So if you just keep on doing this, then any two points that were over here will suddenly find themselves really far from one another. And once they are far from one another, they could just go, they could have very, very different histories. As it happens, in the 1960s, a mathematical model for such dynamics had been constructed by Stephen Smale, very famous mathematician who actually was awarded the Fields Medal. So, Smale had described dynamics of this kind with a construction very much like the horseshoe. And this is, the, this, this is our best idea of how chaotic motion happens in such systems when phase space is stretched, folded, and put back into the same region, into the same general region. In the next lecture, we will consider both the horseshoe map of Smale as well as related maps that deal with the, the manner in which phase space evolves.